going to see a new fairness notion. So yesterday we talked about the setting where you had a set of agents n, set of goods, set of little m goods, and uh, the valuations were just given by this matrix where you had agents as the rows and goods as the columns and there's one number for every agent good pair because of the additivity assumption. And yesterday we looked at a bunch of fairness concepts, proportionality, envy fairness, and the relaxations called maximum fairness, envy fairness up to one good, and we discussed some algorithms for finding such allocations. Uh, Today we are going to look at another measure of fairness. Uh, so note that proportionality and beefiness and their relaxations, they are all properties. They are either satisfied or they are not satisfied. Okay, it's a yes, no thing. Today we are going to look at an objective function which assigns a number to every allocation and allocations with higher numbers are intuitively fairer. So this is not a property, this is an objective, it's a measure. Uh, and here's how it is defined. So this, the name of this fairness measure is Nash social welfare. Uh, it was proposed by John Nash in the context of a different problem called the bargaining problem, but it has found important users in the context of fair division as well. So that's why it's named after him. So given any allocation A, The Nash social welfare or NSW of A is defined as the geometric mean of the valuations of the agents. So what I mean by that is you look at B1 of A1, B2 of A2, on and on, times Vn of An. You multiply all of them and take the one in its root. That's Nash social welfare. So clearly it's a number assigned to every allocation. Uh, and can anyone at least try to justify why a higher Nash social welfare might be a sign of fairness? What do you mean highly satisfied? Right, right, right. So uh, just to sort of rephrase uh, what Chen Wei is saying is, uh, just think of, it's a fact about numbers. Think of a bunch of numbers that sum to some constant thing, right? Think of a bunch of variables that sum to a constant and you're trying to maximize the product or the geometric mean of those things, when can you do that? You can do that when you sort of make them equal, right? And that's the sense in which we're thinking about fairness. So roughly, we want to sort of balance out these utilities in some sense, make the happinesses close to each other. Okay, that's why it at least has the feel of a fairness measure. And I'll, I'll formally reason why this is fair in a moment. Uh, so any allocation A star that maximizes the Nash social welfare. So you're, you're given this problem instance and you are looking at which allocation gives the highest geometric mean. Uh, that's called a Nash optimal allocation. So question, does a Nash optimal allocation always exist?
yes, no. What people over here? Undecided. So note that once you fix a problem instance, every allocation is assigned a number, and there has to be some allocation with the highest number. Okay, I don't know which one, but there has to be some. Right? There's only finitely many allocations. So there has to be some A star. Okay? So Nash optimal allocation always exists. And here's why we care about the existence of a Nash optimal allocation. So this is a theorem by, in a recent paper by Karagiannis et al. from uh, EC16. And the theorem says that A Nash optimal allocation is EF1 and PO. Now I'm assuming that everyone understands what EF1 is, and I haven't told you what PO is, so that's what I'll tell you now. PO stands for Pareto optimality. So this is a notion of efficiency of an allocation. In plain English, it simply means that, so you have this allocation A, and there is no other allocation B which could improve some agent without making some other agent worse off. Okay, so if you have to make any other agent happier, you necessarily have to make someone else unhappy. So that's a sort of a notion of efficiency, Q-W. The formal deficient definition is here. So an allocation a is for it optimal if for no other allocation B we have two things happening. The first thing is that that every agent is happier in B than in A. We are saying that this should not happen, okay? And some agent is strictly happier. Okay, so what this definition is saying is that there is no other allocation B that Pareto dominates the allocation A. And this is the definition of Pareto domination. So an allocation B Pareto dominates A if every agent is happier under B, at least as happier under B, and someone is strictly happier. If there is no such dominating allocation, then we say that our original allocation A is Pareto optimal or Pareto efficient. And this is the standard, the gold standard of efficiency in economics. So that's why this result is so interesting because it is saying that a Nash optimal allocation is both fair and efficient, economically efficient. Now, we know that a fair allocation always exists in this sense. We saw two algorithms for finding such an allocation yesterday. Can someone give me an example of a Pareto optimal allocation? So I give you any instance like this. I claim that there exists a trivial Pareto optimal allocation, a very, very simple one. Right. So you take all the goods and assign them to a single agent, okay? The claim is that this allocation is Pareto optimal. Why? The 
Exactly, exactly, right. So think about which allocation could make some someone happier. So the agent who got all the goods cannot possibly be made any happier. He's as happy as it can be. What about other agents? If you try to make any other agent happier, you have to necessarily take away a good from this agent, okay? And if this agent values all these goods positively, like at, at a positive number, it definitely becomes less happy. Okay. So Pareto optimal allocation exists for almost trivial reasons. An EF1 allocation exists because, I mean, we saw two algorithms. So we know that these two notions individually always exist. What this, what this result is saying is that they also coexist. So there is an allocation that is simultaneously fair and efficient. That's why this is so interesting. Okay. Questions? All right, so that's very cool. Here's the not so cool part. that although a Nash optimal allocation always exists, finding one might be troublesome. Okay, so optimizing for this objective is an NP-complete problem. So uh, think of, think, just think of variables that sum up to some constant. Okay, when you try to maximize the geometric mean, you're trying to make sure that those variables are all close to each other. So that's, you're trying to basically make the utilities as close to each other. Now, because you have indivisible goods, you cannot make them all the same, but you're sort of trying to balance them in some way. Uh, well, so once you fix a fair division instance, the sum is fixed because it's additive. So, so if, if the, the sum of all, you, let's just think of a very simple setting of identical valuations, okay, just to get the intuition right. The sum of all, all of those things is a fixed number, whatever it is, I don't know. It's not necessarily one, but whatever it is, it's fixed for that instance. And now you're trying to balance the utilities in some sense, right? So for non-identical valuations, it's somewhat harder, but that's why we rely on objective measures to give us better intuitions. I mean, that's, that's, I understand that's a hand wavy argument. Uh, the formal way of arguing about fairness is this one. It's EF1 and PO. Okay. okay, so that's the great news. This is not. Uh, There's another bad news. Uh, in fact, this problem is APX complete. This APX hard. This is a somewhat more recent result by Lee from Information Processing Layer 17. Uh, this simply means that even approximating the Nash social welfare objective to a certain constant factor, that is also an NP hard problem. Okay. By the way, how do you prove such a thing? The NP hardness result? What's the only reduction we have sort of talked about so far? Partition, right? Do people see how to prove this using partition? Think of identical valuations, okay? There's a bunch of numbers that sum to some constant. You just want to maximize their geometric mean. How do you do that? Yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay. Uh, 
okay, yeah. So it should boil down to a, a partition. Okay, just just go go back and think about it. Okay, but this thing is incomplete even with identical valuations. Okay, so the same proof that we discussed yesterday in the context of NB freeness and proportionality, just redo it for a different problem. So that's that. Uh, now one way to address the computational barrier could be to design approximation algorithms, but we know that getting arbitrary uh, approximation ratios is hard, so you can only get to certain constants. And the other thing is that even if you have a constant factor approximation, it is not guaranteed to have those fairness and efficiency properties. Right. So although an exact solution has those properties, it need not be the case that an approximate solution has those properties as well. Right. So either you design an approximation algorithm which has both of these properties as well, or we can think about special cases of this NP-hard problem that we can solve efficiently in polynomial time and exactly. Okay, so that's good. The second thing is going to be our goal for today. We are going to solve a special case of the Nash social welfare maximization problem. Uh, which is that we are going to focus only on binary valuations. What this means is for any agent I and any good G, the valuation is either zero or one. So an agent either likes a good or does not like a good. Okay, in other words, this matrix is going to be a zero one matrix. And the theorem that I'm going to prove for you is that For binary valuations, a Nash optimal can be computed in polynomial time. So I'm going to start with some simplifications. The first thing is think of any Nash optimal allocation for binary valuations. Is it possible for an agent to be allocated a zero valued good? So in the Nash optimal allocation, every agent is getting some goods, right? Would it make sense to assign a good to an agent who values it at zero? No, right? You might as well give it to someone who values it at one and improve the objective function, right? So each good uh, in a Nash optimal allocation Each good is assigned to an agent that values it at one, at a non-zero amount. The second thing that I'm going to assume is that whatever instances that I work with, they have some allocation whose Nash welfare is bigger than zero, okay? So, so 
along cushion E. So if this happens, then in particular, the NSW of the optimal allocation is bigger than zero. Uh, this is just a technical assumption. Uh, I don't want to go into those divide by zero things and all that. And uh, if you're not happy with this assumption, uh, all I can say is that the problem continues to be NP hard even in this setting. Again, think of partition. So as far as the agenda of designing Algorithms for special cases of NP hard problems is concerned. I think this is a legitimate assumption still there. All right. So let's get into the algorithm. Okay, so let's start think let's start thinking about how we can improve a suboptimal allocation. Okay, so suppose I give you an allocation that whose Nash welfare is strictly less than the optimal Nash allocation. We'll start thinking about some operations that we can do on the suboptimal allocation to improve its Nash welfare. Okay, and from there we'll build up our algorithm. So here's a picture. I'm going to use triangles to denote the agents and uh, circles to denote the goods. Uh, if I draw an edge, a solid edge like this, that means under the current allocation, the agent owns the good. So this agent owns these three goods. And this agent owns this good. And without loss of generality, assume that every good is assigned to an agent who values it at one. If not, you can, there's a trivial improvement, right? All right, okay. And I'm going to draw a dashed edge to denote that this agent, although it does not own this good, it values it at one. All right? So suppose this is an allocation where this agent is, has these three goods, this agent has this one good. What is the Nash welfare of this allocation? Group three, exactly. So the Nash social welfare of this allocation, let me call this allocation A. NSW of A is equal to this agent's utility is three. This agent's utility is one. So it's this, which is square root three, 1.7 something. Okay. Now, does anyone see an obvious way of improving this, improving the Nash welfare of this allocation? which is do a swap, right? So here's a, here's a good that it values at one, it won't mind having this good. And if we do that, if we swap this good, we get an allocation B, has both of these goods, another agent has not two goods, and what's the new Nash welfare? Okay. So by making this pairwise swap, we are able to improve the Nash social welfare. So that's, so whenever you see a pairwise swap like this, makes sense to do it if it gives you an improvement, right? It's a local improvement, the pairwise swap. Sometimes though, pairwise swaps might not do the job for us. So think of an example like this. Okay, so this owns these three goods, this guy owns these two goods, this guy owns this one good, and these are valued at one edges, okay? The Nash welfare of this allocation is three times two times one, whole raised to one third, Now notice that this is set up for a swap, but if I perform a swap for this pair, 
this guy will be at utility 2 and this guy will be at utility 3. Right? So although I can do a pairwise swap, it's not giving me any kind of improvement. Right? Same for this pair. 2, 1, if I do a swap, then it would be 1, 2. Geometric mean stays the same. Right? But now think about what would happen if we do a chain of these swaps. If you do both of these swaps. We get something like this. Yes? What I've done is I've moved this good here and I've moved this good here. Okay? What's the new Nash welfare? Four. Q, yeah, right. It's two. Yeah. Two times two times two. So although a single pairwise swap did not do the job, a chain of pairwise swaps did the job for us this time. Okay? And it, I'll show to you that this is all you need in terms of local improvements, a chain of swaps. You can call me Rohit. Yeah. Yes, yes, but I just drew the dotted lines for reference. Yeah, I mean, uh, so yes, technically I should be drawing things like this. Yeah, but I don't need to because I'm not doing any more swaps. So, yeah. Thanks. More questions? Okay. So uh, let me give you a sort of a definition first and then we'll prove, start proving certain results. So I'm going to define a graph associated with any allocation. Just like we defined NV graph yesterday, it's going to look, it's going to look something like that. Uh, but there will be no NV as such. Uh, for any allocation A, define a bidirected graph. Uh, I don't have a name for this graph, I'll just keep calling it G of A as follows. So the vertex set is the set of agents, one, two up to N, and if an agent has some good, if agent U owns some good under A, that is valued by V at one, then I draw an edge like this. This indicates a potential swap that I could do. Okay. In fact, if U has K goods that V values, I'm going to draw K edges, one for each good. And the edges can also go in the other direction. Okay, so uh, u to v, if actually k edges u to v, if there are k goods owned by u, that is in a of u. that are valued by V at one. Okay, so, so I can draw this graph easily. What does a path in this graph look like? What does it mean? A directed path? Sorry? 
swaps, but it's a chain. It's a chain of it's because this is like one pair was swap followed by swapping a different good followed by swapping a different good. So it's it's a chain swap, right? Which is exactly what we did over there. All right. So a path P, say from U1, U2 to UK. denotes a chain of swaps. So there is some good G1 that is moving from U1 to U2, some other good G2 that is moving from U2 to U3, and so on. All right. So given any path, what happens to the utilities of these agents? So say there is a path and I make the swaps along those paths. How would the utilities of these agents vary in the new and the old allocation? How would they differ? So what about U1? First one goes down by one. It's losing one good. What about U2? It stays the same. U3, same. Every intermediate agent stays the same. Only U1 goes up by one. Sorry, goes down by one. UK goes up by one. Great. There's a plus one here. Oh, sorry. There's a there's a drop of one here. All of these agents are the same. There's an increase of one here. And come to think of it, there's nothing special about this path. As long as the start and end points are fixed, any path between U1 and UK in this graph is going to have the same effect, no matter what path I choose, right? So instead of searching over paths, I can search over pairs of agents. If path is my currency of local improvement, I haven't proved that to you, but let's say it is, right? Then it does not matter which path I choose between these, as long as I fix the start and the end points, right? All I care about is how do the utilities change, because that is what is going to matter in the Nash Social Welfare Objective, right? So there can be many, many paths, exponentially many paths, but there are only so many pairs of agents in this graph, n squared, uh, n choose two, right? And that's the intuition. That is going to make our life easier. Instead of searching over exponentially many paths, we can just iterate over pairs of agents and see if an improvement is possible. If it is, we do it and keep going. Let me just write this down. Search over paths. And search over agents. Okay. Let me write down a lemma that formalizes this. So say A is a suboptimal allocation. And this lemma guarantees that there exists a pair of agents, U and B, such that two things happen. The first is that the agent V is reachable from U in this graph, meaning there is some path from U to V in this graph. from U in the graph G of A, this one. And reallocating 
along any path from u to v, any path from u to v in this graph. leads to an allocation A prime. So let's say we reallocate along a path P. Reallocate simply means you do the, the chain swaps. Okay. Let's say we do that along some path P. I'm going to use this notation A of P. This means that original allocation was A now you subject it to reallocations along the path P and this is the new thing that you obtain. Okay, so A of P, it's, it's not a function but that's the notation I'm going to use. Okay. And such that reallocating along any path leads to the following improvement in the Nash social welfare. So this is the natural log of A star. A star is some Nash optimal allocation. Okay. So the, this number is the same for any Nash optimal allocation. It doesn't matter which one we're talking about. Okay, so this is a bit of a mouthful, so let's break it down, what's happening here. Uh, start with the suboptimal allocation A, okay? The lemma says that there exists an improving path, right? There exists a pair of agents and some paths between those pair of agents that could lead to some improvement in the Nash social welfare, right? The part B of the theorem of the lemma quantifies that improvement. So this term to the left of the inequality is the difference is how far A prime is from being optimal, right? And this term here is how far A is from being optimal, right? The lemma is saying that this new distance, like distance from optimality, is at most some fraction less than one from the old distance. So we are getting closer to the optimal. So A star is the Nash optimal allocation. So now that we know this lemma, can anyone think of what algorithm we should use? Okay. Can you can you draw it actually so that everyone can see what you're saying? I think it's easier. I'm not sure they can all hear you, so Why is this improving? 
Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just saying there exists some pair of agents such that there ex there will be an improving path between. I'm not saying between every pair of agents there's an improving path. I'm just saying there is some good pair of agents where there is an improving path. That's. Okay, does the lemma make sense to everybody? It's all it is saying in plain English is that if you have a suboptimal allocation, then there is an improvement possible simply by using the chain swaps. And this is formally how how much an improvement means, right? This is how much the improvement will be. Okay. Is there a question? Sorry, I'm not doing this, I promise. <laughs> uh -huh. I think that is why we switched to this one. Sorry, I'll get to Yes. So maybe, wait, so if no other vertex is reachable from... Oh, I should stay here. Then you'll have to speak a little louder. <laughs> yeah. You can. So that was, I think, the question here as well. So the lemma is just saying that there exists some pair of agents that will offer an improvement. It's not saying that any pair of agents will offer an improvement, right? So reachability is not reachability is is not a sign of improvement, right? We we did some examples which where we had reachability, right? Of swap was possible, but it did not necessarily lead to an improvement. So reachability is one thing. Improvement is another thing. Okay. Does that answer your question? Other questions? You had a question? <coughs> Is Neil supposed to be back? Or? Okay, I'll uh, I'll proceed. So, I think the algorithm now. Once you know this lemma, the algorithm almost writes itself now. So, I'll call it alg binary because of binary valuations. So the input is some allocation, perhaps a suboptimal allocation A. The output is another allocation uh, A prime, say. And the steps are that first, it's an iterative algorithm. We initialize some A0 allocation to be the original allocation and uh, so don't worry about this number, it's just something that we need to make this, this lemma work. Think of it as this some polynomial in M and M. Don't worry too much about it. I'm going to run a for loop. First step, construct that graph that I defined there. Uh, G of 
AI minus one. Okay, this is exactly this graph. This can be done efficiently, right? Yes. Okay. Define a reachability set as a set of pairs of agents. Basically, if U has a path to V in this graph, okay. Again, efficiently computable. There's a path from U to V in G of A I minus one. Now, if R is empty, this terminate, just output whatever you have. Okay. So the interesting stuff happens when R is non e non empty. All right. Uh, otherwise, so this is the find this comment that R is not empty. Otherwise, I trade over all pairs of agents. So, for each pair of agent U, UV in this reachability set R, let A I minus 1 u comma v again some no heavy notational overloading this, these are not functions this is just an allocation that you obtain by doing a reallocation from u to v okay it's it's like this thing here And note that I'm deliberately not specifying along what path because it does not matter. So you do this for every pair, okay? You, you obtain a bunch of allocations here and you see if any of them has a higher Nash social welfare than your current I trade. So look at E I minus one U V over all U V's in R. Okay, so this is the allocation that gives the maximum Nash social welfare among all of the things that we have come up with here. If this thing is strictly better than the Nash welfare of A I minus one, then what do I do? Update what? So what, what should I write? Give me the specific thing. A little louder. A, I think you mean AI for the next iteration. A prime is the final thing, but AI is what? Is the allocation that maximizes. Yeah, I think you would have said. Fine, exactly. So AI is, uh, is the arg max of this thing basically. Just write a little more cleanly. So it's an arg max over ei minus one uv's such that uv is in R. Okay, so all the allocations that we constructed here, we are just looking at the one that gives the maximum Nash and calling it AI. And if it does not give an improvement, Otherwise, I do what?
what is AI? I have reached an optimal allocation, right? So there will be an if as long as I'm at a, I'm at a suboptimal allocation, I have to have an improvement there. If I fail to have an improvement, then I must be at the optimal allocation. So now a prime, the final output is uh, AI minus one. Yes? That's the algorithm. Okay. So I'm facing a sort of a moral dilemma at the moment because I want to prove the theorem using this algorithm and I also want to prove the lemma but the lemma, the proof of the lemma will take me a while and we don't have that much time left. So in case I'm not able to cover it, uh, I encourage you to read the lemma from the reference on the web page. Okay. Everything. Uh, by the way, everyone has, knows the URL of the web page, right? I keep on saying it, but I'm not sure if everyone has access to that. Does everyone know that there's a web page for this mini lecture series? Okay. So I'll leave the lemma here for a moment. We are going to prove the theorem that you can, this basically this algorithm terminates in polynomial time and gives you a correct Nash optimal outcome. Uh, is the polynomiality clear? The running time? Anyone who's not clear about polynomial running time? So let me just, uh, so the theorem I'm proving is A prime is Nash optimal. Okay, and uh, try to think about why this is polynomial time, not very difficult. So here's the proof. Okay, so Let's analyze iteration i. What happens in iteration i? I'm simply going to use the lemma now. So a i is what we get after iteration i is complete. a i minus one is what we have when iteration i begins. Uh, and the lemma says that this should be true. Yes, I've just copied the the part B here. What can you say about this thing? So this is for a generic lemma, uh, this is for a generic iteration i. I can simplify this in terms of the difference between a star and ai minus 2, right? Again using the lemma, just repeated applications of the lemma, okay? So apply the lemma repeatedly. This thing is 1 minus 1 over m to the i times natural log of NSW of a star minus natural log of NSW of a0, which is just the input a. Yes? Okay. So this is true for any iteration i. It's saying that at the end of iteration i, the distance from optimality is this factor times the initial distance. Now, the algorithm runs for 
these many iterations okay so i'm simply going to plug this number here right because the algorithm runs for at most that many iterations so after that i should have a nash optimal allocation with me right let me just do that now since i is at most for the number 2m n plus 1 log mn Yeah, can you raise the lemma now? It's mostly algebra from this point onwards. A star minus ln n is w of a prime so because I'm substituting this so the final output allocation is a prime this thing is at most oh, let me write it here 1 minus 1 over m raised to the power of this I'm going to write this like this Okay. Can we say something interesting about upper bounding this quantity? Sorry? Uh, ah, yes, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Now can we say something interesting about this? Okay, let me write it down then, see if people agree to that. Is that true? So I'm I'm using this identity that Oh sorry Do you want me to rewrite some parts of this I hope everyone can read this right Okay uh -huh. So, everyone happy with this? I mean, there's not much we can do. Right? But it's true. So. Alrighty. What next? Okay. Uh, I don't like this term here, so I want to get rid of this. Can I do that? Is log of NSW of A0 at least 0? Yes. Right? We don't want, uh, so in effect, it's saying that the NSW of A is at least 1, right? Which we can assume maybe our suboptimal allocation was at least at a non zero Nash filter. So fine. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of this term here. Uh, great. So now 
what do I want? This thing is the same as yes exactly mn raised to the twice n plus 1. So let me write it here. Uh, mn raised to the twice n plus 1 a star. Yes? Okay. So okay I don't like this term here as well. So can I write it like this? Know that there are little m goods in the system. Even if every agent gets all of the goods, Nash welfare will still be m. So that's clearly an upper bound. Of course, not every agent can get all of the goods. That's why it's an upper bound. Yes? Okay. I don't like this term either. So I'm going to upper, upper bound this by m. So what I'm left with is m to the 2n plus 1 times n to the 2n plus 2. Yes, because log of n is at most m. Uh, now I'm going to write this. I want to. I mean, I'm doing all of this strictly because I want to write this in a specific form, and you'll see what the form is. Uh, so this step is only going to use the fact that both m and n are at least one. There's at least one agent and at least one good, and see if you agree with me. them to the n whole square. Okay, I've basically thrown away one of the m's. Yes, and I've thrown away a lot of the n. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to use another identity slightly less obvious maybe. This thing here is less than ln of 1 plus 1 over m to the n and this is true because this thing holds. Now, if you don't believe me, go ahead and plot it. And finally, this thing is equal to this, which means overall we have. this thing and that inequality is a strict inequality okay this implies that so now I'm moving from known that this is a geometric mean that has a 1 over n in the exponent and that you can think of as the coefficient here that gets cancelled out with this 1 over n right that's why I had to sort of cling on to this 1 over n so dearly uh, Now I have I now now I can work with the product instead of the geometric mean essentially. This thing times one plus one over m to the n. Okay.
Any questions so far? This is just the Nash product. Okay. <coughs> All right. Now, by definition, A star is a Nash optimal allocation. So, the product for so this term here dominates this term here. So I can write. Yes. Now note that this thing is an integer, right? And this thing is also an integer. And these are two integers that are separated by this multiplicative factor. Okay. What is this thing? The whole thing. So. The maximum that the Nash product can be, even if every agent gets every good, like all the m goods, it can be at most m to the n, right? So, so this whole thing is at most plus one. because the valuations are binary and there are little m goods and n, n agents. So this is an integer, this is an integer and these are two integers that differ by less than one. So they better be equal, right? And if these are equal, what do we know about A prime? But it has to be Nash optimal. It's basically sandwiched between these two things, right? And that's it. Okay. So I understand it's a somewhat of a boring proof, a lot of algebra, nothing deep happening, but yeah, so is life. Uh, the proof of the lemma is more interesting, but it will take me a fair amount of time to cover that. I'll be happy to talk about it offline, uh, but I do encourage you to go back and read it, read the proof. Okay.